Good morning, everyone. Have, uh, I was going to say Happy New Year then. Uh, for some reason, I've got that in my script. But welcome to the ICG's Digital Academy webinar series. I'm Sally Allsop, the ICG committee member responsible for running our webinar program. So for today's webinar, we're delighted to welcome Kirsty Storer, who's an ICG member and director of Hold That Thought Limited, and Sophie Wright, who's a partner at Discover.ai. Sophie started her career client side with marketing roles at Grand Met and Warner Lambert before spending six years at Added Value, leaving as a board director. After running her own consultancy for several years, she joined Discover AI at its inception in 2018 and has since become a partner. Before going independent in 2004 and subsequently setting up Hold That Thought, Kirsty was an insight director at Added Value where she worked with Sophie and spent 18 months working for CMR in Toronto. Kirsty has really enjoyed the way that Discover AI has brought a whole new dimension to her research skills, being still very much in tune with how people think, but helping you to follow hypotheses, make new connections and solve challenges at the speed of thought. Kirsty and Sophie will be revealing how Discover AI can be a valuable, low cost and rapid alternative to lengthy call phases for uncovering inspirational insights to fuel opportunity for clients. So as usual, after, the, um, after their presentation, we'll be running a Q&A session at the end. So please type your questions into the question box as we go along and I'll read them out after the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sally and Lucy. Hang on, Hang on a oh, second. <laughs> I beg your pardon. So uh, we're really grateful to Elizabeth Norman Consulting for sponsoring this webinar. Elizabeth Norman Consulting provides contract and temporary talent for the customer insight, market research and data professions. They offer payroll services, contract solutions and consulting, including statement of work to the temporary market. Uh, before I hand over to Kirsty and Sophie, the next webinar to note down in your diaries will be a presentation by the finalists of the MRS uh, Indie Award on the 4th of February, followed by um, an, a timely update on GDPR and the implications of Brexit for Indies on the 25th of February. So please note those down in your diaries. Don't forget um, that we're able to offer great value sponsorship opportunities with each of our webinars. Sponsorship normally costs £100 for a lot of exposure on our website, mailers and social media, and of course on the day. So please contact Lucy if you'd like to know more. So our speakers today are Kirsty Storer of Hold That Thought and Sophie Wright of Discover AI. And I will now hand over to Kirsty and Sophie. Great, thank you. Apologies for the premature jumping in there. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to come and talk today. We're really pleased to be here. We're gonna to intend to be quite informal, A, because that's who Sophie and I are, and B, because we think that sort of will help in terms of understanding the, how Discover AI um, sort of works and its benefits and hoping to leave questions at the end because we'd quite, quite like the session to be more interactive. Um, gosh, if you told me a few years ago I'd be talking about the role of AI in day-to-day -day insight, I would have not believed you um, because although I'm not a complete Luddite when it comes to technology, AI certainly sounded scary and technical and maybe to, to a number of you guys. Um, it's a million miles away, I thought, from what I do as a quali where I'm proud of my touchy-feely skills and being able to talk to people and unpick meaning in what they say and don't say. And I do remember being very skeptical, hearing companies say a few years ago, or oh, they can do your group analysis for you. And you know, there were some very rogue transcript examples where you wonder what on earth the group had been talking about because it didn't seem to bear any resemblance to a normal discussion with the, with the language. But of course, fast forward to now, AI is everywhere, isn't it? I mean, it's one of the fastest growth areas. There's a real buzz about it still. It's no longer the new kid on the block. And in, in insight, it's clearly made a lot of headway. Way. And I personally became more tuned into this when old colleagues of mine, uh, forgive the old Sophie, from agency days, um, saw the opportunity to focus in on this area and they built the Discover AI platform around it, which is to gather content from a vast array of online sources. And initially, I guess, understood it really as especially about time saving and budget efficiency. 
but in today's climate sadly where face-to-face -face is you know pretty much non-existent it seems to have an even more pertinent role and this is why it seemed very opportunist to come and talk to you today and sh show the tool I have to say I'm still relatively new to it, but I have found um, with the experience I have had from the off that it is really inspirational and insight mining and also in its flexibility in terms of how it can be used either as a standalone project or as part of a project process, perhaps at the beginning phase to replace a discovery element where you want to talk to experts, maybe get some trends piece in there. It's sort of cut short all that necessary sort of extra hassle and extra expense. And so it's a tool I'm sure many ICGs may welcome adding to their armory. So the idea is to show you the tool, some example output, and then show you the platform in action to see how easy it is to use and what you might see. Um, moving just on next chart, so um, I just thought it was useful, worth saying that there's obviously a lot out there about machines taking over the world, robots replacing our jobs. We've had the exam controversy about results and how algorithms and AI perhaps was not the best uh, way to be dealing with that. And lots of stuff about what AI can and can't do. For me, as a, as a bit of a Luddite, as I say, it's, I think the useful analogy in terms of thinking how it can be used for insight is in the chess um, analogy, which I understand this in the early test cases was actually uh, to see whether AI could beat a grandmaster at chess. And what's interesting is the answer is yes, you can teach a, a machine to teach a grandmaster at chess and learn how to play like a grandmaster because there's only a set, certain set of automated, repetitive rope moves that you can learn. And then when you start thinking about our world of insight, when it's really about people and consumers and brands and how they all come together, it's not about learning moves off by heart or, you know, particular this absolute uh, fixed methodologies and so on. And really the questions there are more, why do people like playing chess in the first place? What other games might they play? What do they get out of it? What emotions and motivators and drivers are they? Are they? And those are the questions obviously that we're, we're looking at every day in our insight roles. But actually AI can really help there as well. And that was the interesting fact because although it's these questions are human and woolly and intractable and, and diverse and machines obviously can't do that in their own right what they can do is help get to those answers quicker help you grapple with those those uh, difficult questions by exposing you to lots of really interesting online diverse conversations in the online world just as if you were talking to a load of different people in the real world and through its I don't know all the techniques and the, the technology, but through something like its accelerated reading tool will enable us to get to the interesting nuggets um, quicker. So I guess the most important message for me out of all this is, and to reassure any of you that is skeptical, is the fact that really at the end of the day, the AI uh, tool is all about 100% human expertise, even though we've got Mr. Potato Head there, as we like to call him. Um, it's 100% human expertise, but powered by machine learning to really enhance our existing analysis skills, the things we do every day around making connections, identifying patterns of behavior and, and opportunities for our clients. Sophie, however, is far better placed to talk about the platform than I am um, and its capabilities. So she's going to show the example output and platform in action. I'll interject from a, a user standpoint on the benefits I've seen and, and we'll sort of tag team throughout. So over to you, Sophie. Okay. Hi. Really, really great to talk to everybody today. Thank you, Kay. Um, so first of all, just to introduce Discover AI um, and Discover AI is a company that's really in its infancy. We've been going about three years um, and at Discover AI we've created a platform that works on machine learning AI to sort of help get to insight and really the first and most important thing to say and that builds very much on what Kay has already said is that sort of at the heart of what we do is just a bunch of insight people with experience in both cultural and consumer insight and in working with brands um, who are really sort of passionate about their work and, and passionate about uncovering kind of exciting juicy insights um, and that passion is really the important part because it was that passion that at the beginning led to sort of trying to work out what we could do with AI in the world of insight and what the application was. Um, so because we we're passionate about working with consumer insight, um, what we wanted to do was find a way to uncover that sort of rich human insight 
that without the sort of heavy lifting. So it was all about trying to do the best bit of our job and eliminate the bits we didn't like and the worst bits. Um, and I think we all know that when you do a lot of face-to-face -face interviewing and groups, for instance, and even with online communities, there is an awful lot of kind of time and labor involved in sort of extracting from all the raw material that you gather the really juicy bits that start to feel exciting and inspirational and, and meaningful. And those are the bits that we're all kind of in the insight game for. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the company was created with the vision to sort of uncover rich emotive insights but to find a way to do it that captured the best that ai could offer us and the best that machine learning could, could offer us so what we do is we work with online content from online sources and when i say online i mean across anything that you can find out there in the ether whether it's blogs influencers online magazines consumer forums consumer chat and conversations on social media whether it's what brands are saying, particularly sort of emergent brands in new areas, their narratives can be fascinating and very insightful. So we um, can go with our platform to anything out there in the online world, and that can be gathered in um, and used within our platform as a kind of a source of insight, a kind of data sample, if you like. So what we are doing on any given project is going um, across all the available sources, and there's obviously a diverse wealth of different types of sources, different types of conversation narrative out there in the online world. Um, and we're really deciding, first of all, for the brief that we have for a given client, what is the kind of single-minded key question that they're trying to solve? Um, so we have a kind of set process that we go through. And the first part is to really nail down, you know, what's the point of this? What's the end of our, what's the end of our exploring? What are we trying to find? Um, and whereas sort of traditional qual can end up with, you know, we all know the shopping list syndrome where the client says, oh, while you're at it, while you've got those guys in the room, can you just ask them about this, that and the other? Um, and what we tend to do is a little bit the opposite. So we tend on our projects to try to narrow it down to one really sort of single minded, quite emotive question that's driving our work and once we've identified that key question for the client really important then is that we sort of hand select hand pick in a very bespoke and curated way the specific bits of online content that are going to be relevant for the job at hand so often when people talk about AI and the kind of work we do and online stuff they immediately jump to social listening and we're, we're sort of very keen to point out that we are not social listening so we are not just sort of piping in the whole of um, Twitter or the whole of the internet into the platform and then sort of in a very blunt way groping around trying to find something relevant absolutely opposite the same as you would define a sample of respondents and think about you know demographics but also attitudes behaviors those would be the things that allowed you to define what was the sample for your qual or your quant we would define our sort of hand curated hand-picked sample of online sources for the project at hand to bring sort of real meaning but also inspiration um, to the project and what then happens is once we've just find those sources and there could be as many as 80 or 100 individual sources for a given project where one source is you know one website or one blog or one forum or one online magazine um, once we define those sources the platform goes off to those places gathers in the content that's sitting there it can gather in words and it can gather in images and it can then read through that stuff super quickly um, it understands what's sort of at the core of our exploration, at the core of this question we've defined at the beginning of the, the beginning of the journey. Um, and it then reads and organizes everything it's read into core themes, and it tells us which it thinks are most relevant to our exploration at hand. So that allows us to get across a mass of content very fast and sort of dig into, get our hands on the most relevant bits um, most relevant bits for the project uh, and what we're then doing in our world is sort of creating um, insight territories opportunity territories that are our response to the kind of clients question at the beginning of the journey so that's a very sort of rapid snapshot of how the platform works and what we do um, 
sorry, not moving forward. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to say, and I, I'm aware when you stick up one of these charts with a load of clients on it, it looks like you're kind of bragging or, or selling. And actually the point of showing you sort of a selection of the clients we're working with at the moment, is just to sort of iterate that, you know, these are all clients who have sort of the idea of rich and meaningful human insight, human stories at the heart heart of what they do and the heart of how they drive their brands. Um, so these are these are clients that we're working with in a very sort of insightful storytelling way. This is not about sort of big data, this is about thick data as, as people talk about and about sort of human insight and storytelling. And these is just an example of sort of some of the different types of projects we've worked on and, and a bit from the sublime, sublime to the to the to the more um, pragmatic and practical so you know questions ranging from exploring what the meaning of time is on the one hand and that was um, for a home care brand who wanted to position their brand around the idea of giving time back um, all the way through to explaining the, exploring the relationship between mood and flavor in snacking um, and the opportunities for gut health and, and digestion brands on the other. So a real range of different types of question and different types of use case as well from our clients. Um, I've talked a lot about sort of how the platform works. We engage with and you can engage with the platform in a range of different ways uh, to deliver different types of outputs for clients. So we're using it um, on the left hand side of this chart from a sort of more quanti quality approach an alternative approach to segmentation um, through to sort of much more qualitative insight, insight and opportunity area identification with our springboards. You can also work with visuals in our platform and get to some quite sophisticated levels. Looks as though we've lost Sophie. There's oh. a signal problem. Um, kinds of projects. No, she's oh. there. She's back. Okay, good. We lost you briefly, Sophie. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you did you miss something? We got the signals. We got to the visual output. We just didn't do the last one. Sophie, maybe if you turn off your webcam, I don't know if you can hear me. Turn, turn off your webcam and it might give you more bandwidth for the um, present for slide sharing. Kirsty, if she doesn't come back quickly, could you text her that? Tell her to switch off her webcam. Yeah, I can pick up a bit of this. Um... I haven't got the slides, but I can talk to this page. Um, basically, waiting for waiting for Sophie. So, springboard projects are, are kind of classically what I've been involved in more, which is basically um, ultimately giving sort of ten to fifteen opportunity areas, um, which are driven, as it says, by an insight and a clear answer to the question. So, typically, and obviously, you'd have you'd tailor it yourself if you were using the platform, like I have. But what, what happens, you put the question in, you, you, you sort your sources, you would then um, identify your output as a series of what we call quote pages, which is bringing each springboard to life by uh, sub themes, which really are like when you're in a workshop, you're post-it noting thoughts um, around the room and you're sort of gathering them and then you're theming them and structuring them like that. So that's really, that's really, really useful. And then the landing page, which is this is the discover AI version, but you create your own, obviously your analysis, your direction for how you're going to um, how you're going to uh, pull your analysis together and say what that particular opportunity area was about. And then, of course, there's imagery within the platform that you can use as well. As Sophie said, there's there's an element of the platform which can be about um, adding visual codes. So for each opportunity area. Um, you can you can do a mood board around um, the different visual visual codes. This one being around cool, carefree sociability, for example. Um, 
and I did have a couple of slides to show you. The problem is my broadband isn't isn't good enough to show you the slides, uh, but I had a couple of example projects of um, of springboards that I'd used um, around dessert innovation. Um, and the question really was how what, what's the future for dessert innovation? Where can we get inspiration from the world of well-being well -being and sustainability and indulgence and bring it all together to create different opportunities around these areas? So I was going to show you um, a couple of pages like this, one around interesting future formats, and each of these quotes would be an interesting angle on a futuristic format that would have been pulled from the platform. Uh, and another um, example page was around the area of mindful indulgence, which of course we know is a big theme at the moment, self-care and mindfulness, and equally showing that you could get, you know, lots of different, 10, 10 we typically put on a springboard page, but you could do two, two springboard pages and have 20 quotes um, around different nuances around where mindful indulgence would take you. So whether that would be cakes for, you know, well-being, for with certain ingredients in, um, with, with sort of a social conscience, lots and lots of different angles on that, um, on that sort of side of things. So it's very visual and very instant. Um, at this point, I'm a bit of an impasse because Sophie needs to be able to show you the platform um, and the uh, and the project that she was going to, to take us through to, to as a really good example and show how it works as raw on the platform and as an output. But unfortunately, if she can't get back on, it's the world's worst nightmare. Unless, unless there's any questions anybody wants to ask at this stage while we're just waiting for Sophie to log back in. There is uh, one question which we can hang on a second. Um, let me have a look at this one. Yeah, so Kirsty and Sophie, I'm really interested that you moved from careers in qualitative research into roles that involved AI. Is this a move you would suggest to other freelance qualities? Are the skills and competences required very similar? I don't I wouldn't say I've moved from one to the other. I mean, the, the, I think the two worlds are incredibly complementary. Um, and I think the, that what I've really discovered is and I love my qual role. Uh, but what I've discovered is that increasingly we talk about insight 360, don't we? So in my projects, even as a quali, I'm looking for insight in different places, be it um, talking to experts, talking to trend people, talking to nutritionists, talking to R&D getting technological insights and what's the beauty of AI is it can bring all those other sources all together in a much more instant way so you're not trailing off to talk to people in factories you know the kind of R&D people and you're not trying to find experts in Thailand and and all that kind of you know inefficiencies that come with it Qual still absolutely has a role and there'll be certain we'll come on to this there are certain projects where you wouldn't want to use AI when you when when absolutely it's essential to have consumers at the heart of who you want to speak to and you're answering a question about quite specific behavior but where where there's a question which is almost leading to a future facing stretchy sort of scenario where you want inspiration and particularly feeding into um you know workshops or or uh, exploratory discovery phase of a project before you go off and, and develop positioning um, statements and so on and where you want to really understand that kind of backdrop from a cultural point of view um, that's where it can play a really really complementary role i hope that answered the question sophie's back on now hey i'm so sorry <laughs> so i covered off the springboards we'll move on because i think i've given enough of a flavor so i talked at the cake ones without the cake um cake charts can you actually see my charts no not now um yes can, can now you can now okay why don't you turn off your webcam in case that yeah yeah does okay that... right so one of the things that we thought it would be um really helpful to focus on is sort of giving you guys an idea of how maybe you could interact with the platform and use it in your own way for your own outputs um so what we've chosen is a, is a sort of case study to take you through to, ex to give you a taste, to give you a flavor, a little bit of a journey through how you might use the platform in that way. Now, we've chosen one of the projects that we've done in the platform to sort of give you that exposure. 
it's always really difficult, isn't it, when you choose a uh, project to share because a lot of what we do, I don't feel at all comfortable sharing with a big with a big group of people when it's the work that we've done for our clients. So I'm going to show. I've chosen to share with you a project that we did that was around exploring unmet needs in women's health. Um, it's a project we're really proud of. It's one we're quite passionate of. Um, it was. It won, it won a MRS award actually, so, so we're rightly proud of it. But it's also a project we did pro bono um, for a women's tech hive. So it's a project that I'm able to share sort of unreservedly with you. Um, I'm going to give you a really quick look at what the sort of output of that project looked like, what the end game was, if you like, what the final deliverable was, as the preface then to taking you inside the platform to show you sort of the workings out behind the scenes and how we use the platform and the core content within the platform to get to that output. So the project was about examining sort of unmet needs in women's health. Um, it was a fascinating piece of work. Um, just to sort of reiterate, we have a kind of key question that we kick off any project exploration with. So this one was all about um, exploring online conversations around women's health and wellness, but also the broader context of women's lives in order to sort of uncover the really key unmet needs for women in the health space. Uh, and this was all as kind of inspiration, as I've said, for a, a women's tech hive who were looking to develop new apps um, for this specific area. And just as a sort of flavor of the kind of sources and the spread of different sources we might go to in the online world, you can see this list below that has got everything from sort of online journalism, reviews of books, influencers and bloggers, uh, what brands are doing, forums, online magazines, um, lots and lots of different things. And I suppose one of the benefits, I think Kay's kind of touched on it already at the beginning, is that when we go to the online space, there's a really rich array of different things out there that we can kind of get our hands on. Um, and it allows you to look into the core of an area, but it also allows you to look a little bit more broadly and get some different perspectives and some sort of different sources of inspiration. And the important thing also to say is in different languages as well. So the platform um, has a can translate um, the sources. Obviously, you, you you pay for for that if you want different languages, but that's fantastic. So if you do want in skincare, for example, I've done a lot of cosmetic work where you're looking to South Korea and uh, Asia for inspiration. So to be able to get sources from those places um, and then have it translated, and it will back translate if you if you're not sure about you know, something you want to get a local person to check it. Um, as you can see here on this um, area, it was the UK, US and some global mix, but I know that some projects I've been involved in have had, you know, up to kind of 10 different countries and 10 different um, languages. So I think that's really worth, well, point to make. Yeah, no, great, great point. Um, so on this particular project, um, I mean, just a, a couple of things. There was sort of a, a, an upfront, it became immediately apparent when we started to dig into the work that this sort of famous data gap that gets talked about, it, it's a real thing, it's real. Um, there's an enormous data gap and it drives some huge issue areas and some huge needs in women's health. Um, and there was a whole load of sort of upfront quotes and verbatims and stories and anecdotes that we uncovered just in the initial phases of this project that spoke to that, the sort of, you know, the assumptions that women are the same as men and therefore the sort of health measures are the same, the taboos that get talked about, the things you can't talk about in women's health, the things that aren't believed. Um, but really digging into that data gap, we were able to identify sort of eight really big macro causes, cultural sort of embedded societal beliefs and behaviors that really drive the existence of that data gap and are at the heart of a series of sort of issues in women's health that are, that are not dealt with and that obviously create huge opportunities moving forward. Um, and these sort of areas here are quite typical of the kind of quite rich, pertinent, uh, emotive areas and insights that, that we tend to uncover on our on our project using this platform. Um, I'm not going to talk to all of these. You can see them. A um, couple of my favourites. Um, so the idea that that women are really just small men 
Um, one of the problems that the sort of data gap that exists is because uh, typically, um, I guess the patriarchy lies behind uh, the kind of metrics and measures that exist in, in kind of health uh, tracking and health behavior. Um, and not all people are the same and women are very different from men and they're not just small men, they're very, very different. So that was a favorite. Working for Winters, all of the kind of shame and taboo that exists around a lot of uh, women's daily experience of health and the things that cause issues um, and the things that are a problem are, are things that we're not really supposed to talk about, that they're disgusting um, and that women then live perpetually with the idea that a lot of what they're experiencing must be something that they alone are experiencing and, and is not to be talked about. So, so stays, stays sort of beneath the surface and therefore undealt with. But the other thing we did in this project was we went on to explore specific condition areas. So those are the sort of overarching cultural signifiers that explain some of the reasons why there is an issue. But we then went on to do some quite practical work to uncover specific issues around uh, specific condition areas and some of the emotional significance um, around this. One of them that um, Kay said I was old, earlier thank you Kay one of them that's close to my heart the ones around the menopause so um you know typically we tend to talk about the menopause as as kind of one thing but even the idea that the perimenopause is very different from the menopause um the idea of the perimenopause as a kind of emotional waiting room um all these things that start to happen to you that feel actually really quite crap but you just have to get on with it nevertheless. Um, don't worry, it's just the arrival of the menopause. menopause. Could be sort of five or 10 years like this. Just get on with it. Um, there's a whole series of quite specific condition areas like this, and this was very important for the client we were working with because they were looking for inspiration um, to help with the development of specific apps and specific tech solutions to help women track these conditions and deal with them in different ways. So again, I'm just gonna let you eyeball some of the areas that we came up with. There are five on this page, uh, another four here, um, and some specific ones that were conditions that we felt um, were affecting everyone that were very um, significant, but that research revealed there was a, a real lack of understanding and knowledge around these areas. Um, so again, I think there were another 10 areas um, in this space. Kay, did you want to jump in there? No, it was just because we hadn't completely covered off the springboard um, thing. So hopefully people are sort of understanding that that's what we were talking about with the springboards that often in, you can, but through the platform, generate 10 to 15 or more areas if you want, that then the output is in these sort of territories with, um, and each territory will have a number of quotes and nuances underneath them and they can be brought to life visually and that's what's so brilliant for clients is because it's kind of without great long decks of insights that go dusty on the shelf they're literally like one pages that can be put around a room in a workshop or can be used again and again chopped up and and looked at in different ways for all sorts of things whereas com brief comms brief or innovation or or leading into more research so yes that's a good example Yes, I mean, here's just one, one of those different areas, one of those springboards, if you like. And what we tend to do is sort of uncover a series of sort of really killer quotes, if you like, that go to the heart of the territory that explain why we've, we've scoped it out as a particular issue or opportunity area. And that also bring to life sort of different voices and different facets um, of, of what the territory is about or what the opportunities are about. So this is just one example from that particular exploration this particular project didn't really have an image component so we weren't really doing image analysis but often we do and i can show you that inside the platform shortly um, and this was really a preface as i've said to sort of getting inside the platform and showing you the nuts and bolts of how it works um, so that's really that's what we're going to go on and do next so i'm just gonna dip out of the powerpoint um, so you won't be able to see anything for a minute and I just no, we need... can we can oh you can oh, oh amazing yeah can you right so where we are here is we're sort of 
inside the platform and inside the particular space reserved to this project that sits sits inside um, our platform. So our platform is sitting in a cloud. So so long as you have the link and a username and a password um, that we would give anybody who subscribed to the platform, you can very easily access the platform. Um, and when you access the platform, you, you kind of see a dashboard. And on that dashboard is, is all the projects that you're working on. Obviously, I've got lots or indeed the sort of different windows you can go through to sort of open up and create a project. Um, and in this particular instance, this is my space inside the platform reserved to this project about the unmet needs um, in women's health. Uh, Kay's just telling me to hide my calendar. I'm afraid I can't see. No, don't worry, it's just a little thing down the bottom. Yeah, because I can't see the screen fully. Sorry, don't worry, I'm then sorry. you can't. Uh, it's not letting me do it. I don't know why. There. Okay, is that better? So what you can see here, first of all, is just all of the different sources. On the right hand side, you can see there's a long list of different sourcing areas that are the sourcing areas I already showed you. So these are the different types of places that we identified it would be really sort of relevant and rich to go to, to start to pull together content, pull together the data sample, if you like, for the project. So, you know, the first one is women's health and wellbeing bloggers and influencers and online magazines. And if I just open up that space, you can see a whole range of different addresses, if you like, for blogs that are sitting in that area. Um, so so if you were doing a project, so it's worth saying that, you know, Discover AI, you can pay for them to do the sourcing for you, or you can do your own. I personally prefer to do my own sourcing as long as it's not in Korean or something. Um, and then you can really start having hypotheses about where do you think would be useful to, to look. But there are obviously experts that you can tap into to, to help you if it's a particularly tricky area. Um, but you can sort of add more sources on as you go. And as, as Sophie's showing you, it's, you know, you can, it's a really, really diverse, rich set that you can, you can access. There's also a library, um, yeah, there's also a library of sources available that you can dig into, which is basically all the sources we've used across a range of projects. Um, so once you've identified your sources and loaded them up inside the platform, as I said earlier, what the platform does is it literally goes off to all of those places and scoops out and gathers in all of the content, which could be sort of words and also pictures that are residing in, in each and every one of those sources. And it all gets loaded into the platform. Now, as I said a little bit earlier, what the platform does, the clever bit, if you like, the, the eye of the AI and, and the machine learning is, it reads everything really quickly and it then understands what it's re reading and organizes it into themes that are relevant for the project at hand. So it understands what our project is about. We feed it what we call nudge terms and those nudge terms are sort of two word statements that absolutely sort of capture and crystallize what the, the project is about. Um, and it then reads everything with that in mind and then creates themes, which are the sort of suggested reading areas that we go into. Uh, and it presents those themes to us in different ways. So it tells us that the most relevant themes in answer to the question that we have are these ones you see at the top. So women's hormonal, women's sexual, women's fitness, women's healthcare, and so on and so forth. It also creates some other sort of different top themes that it suggests we can go to. And these are sort of slightly different lenses, if you like, to take to look at the content. So one it calls favorite themes, and this is based on, on all the projects that anybody at Discover AI has ever worked on, and there are hundreds. What are the themes that it's noticed over time we tend to go to first and we tend to use a lot in the work on the project? So from that understanding, it creates a set of what it suggests are going to be favorite themes. And it also has a way of measuring what we call the emotional resonance of content. And it uses that measure to create another suggested window of what it calls emotive themes. So this would be the start point. For me, this would be my start point on a project. I would look at these. I would very quickly eyeball them and identify the ones that I felt were going to be sort of my go-to, first go-to places to do some further work. 
And if I double click on them, they basically find their way over to this reading list, if you like, on the right hand side of my screen. So anything I double click, it's highlighted and it appears on my reading list over here. And what I would then do, once I've got myself a nice sort of reading list over here of things that I was feeling were looking really interesting, um, I would pick one of those areas and just click on it. And when I click on it, it basically opens up all the content that we've got sitting under that theme. And it arranges it in columns where the columns are headed up by an explanation of the sourcing area that they came from. Uh, and if I choose a different theme, you can see that, you know, in, in health and well-being, there are many different, all of our sourcing areas represented. And what we do now is sort of the job that any good researcher does on any good research projects, which is sort of read and start to really hone in on and extract the things that are super interesting and rich, feel kind of like an insight nugget. So I would start reading through the columns. The things at the top of the columns are the things that the platform is suggesting I read first because it feels they're the most rich and relevant. And as soon as I happened upon something that I thought kind of touched a nerve or was an interesting facet, I simply drag and drop it, drop it over to these um, blocks that we call buckets on the right hand side. Um, now, in a project that's new that you've just started working on, you'd have a series of empty sort of buckets that you start to fill up here on the right hand side. Um, and as you start to spot patterns, so you've, you pick something out as interesting and then you read on a bit and you find something else that kind of resonates with that same point and you can see a pattern emerging, you would, you would sort of pull it over and drop it in the same bucket. And in that period of sort of in that sort of phase of, of reading and identifying sort of interesting facets and nuggets, you start to build up these buckets that in our language we call springboards, but are really sort of insight territories or opportunity territories. Um, and you can you can go over to that view that we call the springboards view and start to see what's shaping up in this sort of insight territory. You can start to give it a title, you can start to give it a description. And you can also start to make notes here about what you think the key insights and opportunities are or the conclusions coming out of that. So you're really starting to craft um, a series of insight opportunities and bring life to them and give shape to them and make them meaningful for your clients and your project all within the project, all within the platform, sorry, um, in, in, in a quite practical sort of a way. Kay, is there anything that you want to add here? I was going to say, um, maybe I'm moving too quickly, but but um, the other benefit of this platform, and it's something which I know came up in the ICG group yesterday, was the fact that some of the sources that you put in, or, or one whole area of sources for a discrete project, could be existing research, so transcripts or um, uh, information, data from online communities or open-ended questions. I think Ella had, had raised that as a question for um, a client who'd got a quant survey and got shed loads of data, which you could look at on an Excel sheet, but would still require an awful lot of, you know, sanity uh, to go through it all. So um, there is a, I believe this is what this is, you're going to talk about open, uh, which is another area yeah. within the Discover AI platform, which I think could be even more useful. It's also probably the most, it's the, the, the sort of most sort of it's the lowest budget one, isn't it? In terms of it's, yes. it's, it's very good value sort of to, um, to use as a quick kind of um, quick pithy way of getting to, to some insights from some existing data. Yeah, so this is one particular sort of window in the platform, if you like, one particular way of using the platform. And it's where you're working with a smaller selection than, than the work I've just showed you, where we were going to sort of hundreds of different online sources. You're working with a slightly tighter selection of document content. So those could be sort of articles, um, more journalistic in nature, or often what's really interesting here is sort of working with transcripts. I know I've had a project I worked on um, alongside a big agency um, and they had used um, consumer online communities to gather an awful lot of sort of short stories, if you like, from consumers. And they ended up with this sort of overwhelming Excel spreadsheet with just 
loads of content in it and they were they they just couldn't get across it in the time so i worked with them using the platform um and what we can do with this sort of part of the platform is load up sort of transcripts in which case you literally load up documents um and what the i'll just sort of show you an example of one actually what the platform will do is sort of take a whole load of documents that you load up and the example that i'm showing you was a lot an awful lot of social media content and then it just lets you um quite quickly and smoothly sort of navigate your way around that content and take different angles in on it so the the project i'm talking about um that i did that had a load of transcripts um, was for a, um, a sort of gummy bear suite. It wasn't Haribo, it was another gummy bear suite. Um, and the, the client, it's actually quite a nice one, which is why I'm just referencing it. Unfortunately, I can't really share it. Um, but the client had basically showed to consumers online, they'd asked them first of all to talk about, you know, what moments they remembered when they'd had this suite and emotions it gave them. So they had quite a lot of quite um, chatty storytelling-esque content from that, but they'd also showed the consumers a series of concepts, um, four different concepts, and the concept was presented as a sort of story, so one of them was about childhood memories, and then they asked the respondent to come back with their own story that was prompted by this story that they'd seen, so it was very much around storytelling, and they just had reams of content, um, and using this, I was able to kind of get across it very quickly and start to pull out sort of key territories that could help with the brand positioning communications. And they were all different story, tell story territories. So, you know, there was one about um, warm moments with mom. And there was one about just sort of being bright and beautiful and jewel-like. So it was about the nature of the suite itself, but it was quite emotive. Um, and this example that you can see here, this was sort of, this was for L'Oreal. Um, and they, like many big brands, which have collect loads and loads of social media content on an ongoing basis. And they sort of end up with more than, more than they can get into or know what to do with. So they asked us to load this just to see what we could do with it. Um, so first of all, here you can see there are various topics that the platform has pulled out from what it's reading. Um, so, you know, makeup, hair, love, color, and we can choose one of those and the platform will just show us everything that's in this content that's about makeup um, or even break it down into, for instance, everything that's about mascara. And then within mascara, it could be everything about sex mascara. There you go. So you can kind of drill in, drill in, drill in, drill in, and then, once you get to the bit you really want to look at, again, it's about your skills as an anal analysis reading uh, and starting to pick stuff out and, and make, um, you know, make territories over here on the right hand side. You can see that the ones that are in yellow are ones I've picked out as being sort of interesting. You can just go by words. So I've changed the, the sort of filter over here and we can literally, every time L'Oreal is mentioned and then it will break it every time Maybelline L'Oreal is mentioned. Or we can choose themes. So if what you're doing is you're using this content to I, I try to get to some bigger overarching insightful themes, we can ask the platform to show us the key themes that are cropping up in the content. And you can see some of the things that come up here. So if we choose, um, I don't know, what do I like? I'm gonna choose um, True Match. So if I choose True Match, it's gonna show me everything that's coming up there. And again, then it's down to my skills as, as an insight person to start to read through and spot what's, what's kind of fascinating or emergent or touching a nerve or feels relevant. And you can see, I've done some work on this and some of the territories that started to come out, there are loads here, but you know, actually what I was doing was looking for interesting stories about the brand and interesting sort of facets to the brand. There's something about mother's dressing table, there's something about hashtag I heart, there's something about my daily beauty stash, plumping and revamping, exciting things are coming. So hopefully evidence that you can sort of put in a lot of data and start to sort of dig into and dig into and dig into and then pull out kind of rich and emotive stuff. That's probably the important, important thing to say, that. sorry, I was going to say, so yeah. the important thing to say is just like qual, just like if we were doing groups or um, you and I were doing groups and somebody else was doing groups, 
each time it's about interpretation so you wouldn't although it's you know you've got all that stuff there it, the different ways in which you you know cut the data or make connections could be different different output for you a different output for me because you know obviously yeah. moderator interpretation still has a layer on top but i think that's what makes it exciting as well and that's where it can, comes back to the skill and expertise of the person using it oh that's good you're showing a uh, output yeah yeah, so I mean, it's absolutely quality and subjective. Can I, can I just interject? We've just got a, a 10 minutes left. So if you want yeah. to run, like, wind up and then we may have time for a, just a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, that was that was literally the last um, slide, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Can you see the chart view now? No. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you just as you were coming to the end. <laughs> we were, we were, we're dead on time, despite dropping out. Fantastic. That really was fascinating. Really a whistle-stop tour, I'm afraid, because I'm sure there's lots more that you could tell us about it. Um, but there are a few questions that have come through, and I'm sure people would like to have a, an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So let's have a look and see what people are saying. Um, uh how about cost um this looks great but at what cost and how long does it take to get initial ideas um and then to deliver the fuller insight i'll let you answer that sophie because obviously it's, it's a bit how long is a piece of string because um as a kind of use sorry just to say as sophie's going to bring up a rate i think you've got a rate card there haven't you sophie i think so um the one thing i would say as as they are pretty flexible. So I think that the point is there is a there is a rate card, but each a bit like when we cost our own projects, um, you know, it's almost bespoke. So um, I know there's a licensing, well, Sophie also, there's a licensing option or an ad hoc option, and that's where there is a bit of flexibility. Yeah, so I don't, hopefully you can see the rate card. I, I would just really stay up front here that to date, the people who subscribe to our platform to, to as sort of users are all coming from fairly big companies, whether that's bigger agencies like, you know, Kantar or Hall and Partners, or whether it's um, a big client, for instance, PepsiCo who have just signed up um, several teams as users, or we do work with Danone uh, Waters. Um, is another one of our, our kind of branded client users. So our rate card at the moment is very much constructed, I, I would say, around that kind of big company, big team approach. And you can see um, that the, the two areas I've talked about today are open on the left-hand side, which is the approach we just showed you with the sort of transcript type content or document content or pro over on the right hand side in blue. Um, so these prices are sort of very structured for those big clients with bigger teams of people. We're super flexible. So I, I recognize, you know, your eye goes to the blue bit in 15,000 a year and, and there could well be people thinking, no way I can't cough up 15K in a one or just like that. Very happy to look at um, sort of bespoke ways of, of getting people access to the platform. Um, could be just a monthly approach, uh, could be sort of a, a you know, just for a, a phase of time. So, so please, 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 we're very flexible, just get in touch to, to talk about how access and, and cost would work um, for sort of more individual users who I know the sort of majority of you will be and how to make that more, more palatable. Um, open for one user for a whole year is 2,000 pounds um so much more accessible i think it's fair to say but again if sort of coughing up two thousand pounds in a wanna um is an issue in any way that we're really open to talking about that in different ways and worth pointing out that anybody who's interested we're happy to give a trial for nothing to all of the platform for sort of a couple of weeks for, for a limited period or we can discuss a pilot where you pay for a couple of months or a few months. It talks about 4,000 here for two months, but again, that's flexible. I'm happy to discuss that. So, so I would suggest on cost, the thing is to just talk to us. On timing, um, it's we, we do projects for clients all the time. Um, I have a team of people who work on projects for clients and we typically turn around a project from end to end to the level of depth that you saw in that women's health example. 
um, in around eight working days. So a week and a half would be a typical turnaround for us. Sometimes we've, we've done them in three days, we've done them in five days, but we like to give ourselves eight days so we can do it kind of calmly, gently and comfortably. Yeah, because the reason for, I mean, I'd say I'm probably slightly slower because I'm not doing them all the time. I'm interchanging them with other projects. Um, but uh, so and also the first project takes you a while to get your head around. Um, but what, what you typically do as well is send clients headlines of where you're coming out with the springboard areas. And that's a useful sort of interim thing to do. And then if they're happy with the sort of areas that are coming out, then then you get on and, and carry on. So I, I would say. I would say I'm more like 10 days, to be honest, from start to finish. But if I really, you know, if you work solidly and immerse yourself in it, then, you know, eight days is very do doable. And as Sophie says, uh, less. And for open, it would be it would be shorter sometimes, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, open, depending, really depends what you're trying to get to. But sort of anything from, you know, half a day or a day um, mm. through to longer if it was a much more expansive sort of quest. Okay. Anyway, and Another question, um, can you judge if it's worth using for a modest scale desk research task, for example, using 50 online sources, how feasible would it be? Um, I think we've looked at seen cost and I'm sure there are other comments to be made about the costs from an ICG as perspective, but can you see it being used as a desk research task? Yeah, definitely. Very much so. so. Yeah, open, open would be an approach there. Uh, and in fact, within Open, I didn't really have time to show you the, the sort of details and the ins and outs, but you can very quickly within Open um, sort of type in specific searches or go to find particular bits of content online, um, journalistic articles around a particular topic, for instance, and then load them in. So totally developed for, for that kind of use case, yeah. And that's certainly how I've used it. So that kind of foundation scoping sort of stage of a project that you sometimes think, oh God, I've got to go away and look on websites and get the data. It's fantastic for that because it cuts to the quick and you can just, you know, start rather than use plowing through websites and articles, it, that's what it does for you. And you can cut to the quick on the kind of themes and stuff coming out, big insights. So can you tell us a little bit more about what the platform is actually doing? Um, is it uh, just a very big, clever search en engine, for example? What, what's the... No, so the, it's, it's absolutely not, actually. Um, so the clever bit is about how it reads. So what it does is it has an inbuilt understanding of kind of the meaning of words and language. Um, so when it's reading, it's understanding, it's using its understanding of language, what words mean, how words get used and the associations between words to get to its themes. And just as a sort of specific example of this, when we work with it, and you know, we can enter in uh, what we call nudge terms and the nudge terms will allow us to sort of find a particular angle into the content. Um, and we use nudge terms at the beginning of a project to sort of explain to the platform what the core thrust of the project is about. Um, and when it sort of sees that nudge term and goes off to filter back the relevant content for us in, in relation to that nudge term, you know, when you use a search term, you write toast and you get all the different references to toast where the toast word toast is used. But when you use toast as a nudge term as opposed to a search term, what the platform would do for us is bring back anything that had the same meaning as toast. So it might come back with grilled or barbecued or smoked as well as toast. It might come back with toasted. It might come back um, with sort of um, things that were about, you know, the expression when somebody's toast, you're done with, you're finished, it's over. Uh, your toast, it would come back with things that had a meaning that equated to the meaning of the word toast and, and was based on how that word get used in different contexts and in different scenarios. So it has a quite a, a sophisticated understanding of language and that's what's driving the smart within the platform. I think it's got NL, it has NLP programming within it, it doesn't does. it? I mean, it the, does, yeah. it does, it's based on NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So quite a lot of questions about the sources of data. Um, first of all, do you, do you literally have to add the sources manually yourself? It doesn't actually use its own 
searching expertise to find and suggest other sources that you might look at. Um, another question um, is, are they are they all, do they have to be free to source input? So not, not many uh, trade websites or, or closed group websites, that sort of thing. It needs to be publicly available sources. Um, so yes, there are some sources that it's not possible to sort of extract and gather the information from. Um, we've done, oh my goodness, we've done about 400 projects now around the world and we've never had, a, a, across a massive range of topics, we've never had a problem getting our hands on enough content or enough sources. Uh, occasionally there are sources that are returned as empty, in which case you, you know, we would replace those sources. We also have a huge library of sources, mm -hmm. I think I meant beginning so from every project we've ever worked on um, if you sign up to use the, the platform you have access to our library um, but obviously yes you have the opportunity to add your own sources on top of that one of things the things we're working on at the moment is sort of adding in the ability to search on top that's a function that we have in open um, and we can move across to the sort of other use of the platform as well but yes um, I personally find when working on the projects that a sort of really meaningful first stop, first step in the project is thinking about what are the places and what are the conversations online that are happening that are going to be kind of pertinent here. It's almost part of that first hypothesizing stage. Um, so, you know, the, the ability to add sources, I think, is, is kind of important. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think, ladies, um, we're, we've run out of time now, so we can have to draw it to a close. Um, there certainly are quite a few comments about the, the pricing and questions regarding whether it's possible to do it on a project by project basis, and also if you might be open to finding a, a particular deal for ICG members. So I'm sure there's um, continuing uh, dialogue, which would be useful from that, that perspective. Um, otherwise, it just remains to say thank you very much indeed. It's been very interesting, very eye-opening. Um, I'm sure we could have spent a lot more time on it to try and get our heads around it and, and, and where it could potentially be of value to us, but it's certainly given us a, a little glimpse of, of what, what you can offer. Um, so thanks very much to Kirsty and to Sophie um, and to everyone else for logging in. And it just remains to say have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank bye you very bye. much for having us. <laughs> bye, yes. bye bye. Bye. Bye.